Well, believe it or not, this is the 25th session <clears throat> on this topic. But the topic is the whole stages of path to enlightenment, so uh, we're just getting started. The um, Lamrim Chenmo that we've been studying, we've entered into the realm of the advanced practitioner, the motive of the advanced practitioner, some times referred to as the great scope, the Mahayana practitioner. And uh, so in order to get here, you know, we've gone through the different uh, steps along the path, the different stages. We've looked at um, really why we're here. You know, why are we here? Why would you come to a Dharma teaching on a Wednesday night? It's an interesting question. But I think an important one. Why are you here? When I taught high school, I taught high school in a low-income area, a uh, tough area. And the kids came into class, and they'd sit down. And my question was, why are you here? Why are you here? Because we don't often ask that question. You know, they're just going to the next period. But it's a different energy that happens when a bunch of kids come in instead of to the next period, they ask themselves why they're here. You know, a lot of people would say, well, those kids, you know, they're here because they have to be. But when they took some time to reflect, they would say things like, they're here because they don't want to be a statistic. They're here because they want some opportunity in life. They're here because they really want to be able to have a meaningful life. And, uh, but that wasn't on their mind when they came in. <laughs> it was on their mind was, you know, who they can mess with or what's going on or, you know, uh, or what happened last period or what's going to happen later. So why are we here? Why are we here on a Wednesday night? Why do we come to a Dharma teaching? And, um, and just the, the fact that we can be here now or have that question invites you to a very specific potential in your life. Uh, and that is the difference between a human life and a rare and precious human rebirth. <coughs> and you might just have one of those. You might just have one of those. If you're sitting in this room, chances are you have one of those, which is very different than a human rebirth. The uh, the thing that gets us usually to a Dharma group on a Wednesday night is the sense that life could be better, that there's something more meaningful, that my stresses, worries, fears, anxieties in this day-to-day -day existence uh, maybe aren't necessary or just not very tolerable. That might get us here. That, wow, maybe there is a way to eliminate the suffering in my life. Maybe there's a way to deal with fear, anxiety, worry. Maybe there's a way to, uh, to not have a mind full of thought and stress and pull. Maybe, maybe so. So we might investigate that. Those Buddhists, they look kind of peaceful, don't they? Yeah, maybe they got something how peaceful I'm here. And um, well, what gets us here and why are you here? So early on we explored this idea. You know, why are we here? And, um, and essentially everything the Buddha taught ultimately is how to not suffer. Not suffer. So oftentimes people come here to learn not to suffer. And what they find here is maybe an opportunity to flourish. Maybe an opportunity to um, find liberation, to not have to be caught up in a cycle of habits and tendencies and impulses and desires that seem much more powerful than us. Emotions that, you know, dictate what I'm going to say and do. I get angry, I do this. I didn't want to get angry, but I got angry and I did this. Is that necessary? And is there a way around that? 
And the Buddha said, you know, it's absolutely unnecessary. And there is a way around that. And there's a way through it. So these Four Noble Truths laid a foundation of a way to start working with our mind, to start bringing it to a balanced view that allows us a peek at the nature of reality itself. And the basic premise in Buddhism is pretty simple. It's that all of my mental afflictions, anger, resentment, jealousy, frustration, fear, anxiety, jealousy, etc., are dependent on one thing, misperception. misperception. So that's the basic premise. If I'm angry, upset, jealous, worried, fearful, anxiety, whatever, I'm deluded. <laughs> you know, I'm not in my right mind. I'm literally insane. <laughs> and, uh, and if I were to see clearly, those mental afflictions could not arise. Well, that sounds pretty easy, right? So how do we learn to see clearly? How do we learn to see things as they are? Well, uh, in order to do that, we need to start paying attention, consciously paying attention to life, to things, to the environment, to myself, to what's happening. And, uh, and that way we can start noticing that things that appear in our mind and how we experience them are not necessarily factually how they are. Which is how we tend to view things, right? Whatever we do, whatever we see, whatever happens, whatever feeling arises, I experienced it, therefore it's like this. You know, It was a terrible day at the office. We'll say that, right? It was a terrible day at work. Is that true? <laughs> well, we have to question that. Is that true? Well, is it a terrible day? Well, in relation to what? in relation to someone who's in Syria right now trying to find their kid that they hadn't seen in a day because the last explosion is really terrible compared to that? Was the whole day terrible? <laughs> or was it five minutes <laughs> that was terrible and then, you know, we dwelled on it the rest of the day? Um, <laughs> were there some good things that happened that day? And what would make a day terrible or not terrible? And if it's terrible, I felt bad. And why would I feel bad if I'm seeing clearly? So we want to start exploring how we experience the world and see, is it the way that we see it? And is it this, I'm experiencing this concrete world that's like this, and that person's funny, and that person's not funny, and this person's cool, and that person's a jerk, and, you know, is that the way the world is? And, you know, anyone with any opportunity to take a few moments to look will realize that's not the way the world is. The world is actually subjective and relational. Every experience you have is a subjective experience. You can only have it through your own lens of experience. And how I see something can be very different than how you see something. And how I see something has a lot to do with whether I got sleep last night, <laughs> how I was raised, my own personal experiences, you know, uh, whether I'm hungry, tired, and my worldview and my belief system, they all interact on everything I see, and I experience it through that. So it's subjective, and it's relational. It's relational to all these other things. Terrible day compared to what? A good day? What's a good day compared to what? Is somebody tall? Then compared to what? Is somebody short in relation to who? But we tend to think of this world as a very concrete thing outside of ourselves, and that person's tall, and this person's short, and they're kind of an idiot, and I like that one, and you know they're funny, and that one's attractive, and that one's not so attractive. And we actually place those characteristics on those people, and we believe it to be so. And we don't even question it. Don't even question it. So the whole day we wake up, we're living in a little land that we kind of tell stories about and we observe things we call it to be true and we never question how things actually work. The <coughs> Buddha says, well, if you start looking at how things work, you're going to start noticing that they're not as they appear. And that characteristic you put in that person is not intrinsically in that person. <laughs> right? It's not in that person. They're not that funny all the time. 
And the person I find funny, somebody else doesn't find funny at all. Right? Look at any politician, right? Ooh, that suddenly gets there. Politician makes a speech. Somebody's sitting there saying, yeah, this guy's great. Knows what he's talking about. So he was thinking, I can't believe people listen to that guy. <laughs> what are they, insane? Same being saying the same thing. Completely different experiences by a bunch of different people. And then whoever we experience, we actually think we know them. You know, I'm just going to get all provocative right now and say Trump. Because, <laughs> you know, he's on the news, right? <laughs> whatever you think of him, whether you like him, don't like him, whatever, when he appears, an image of him comes to mind, and we think we know him. Well, I know what that guy's like. Have you ever met him? No, of course not. We've seen a sliver of a person that shows up on a TV once in a while. But I have pretty much built up his whole character reference point and judged his quality and worth, and I know what kind of person he is and all this stuff. And is that ever true? No, of course not. Because at any point, whatever I attach to him, he's a whole lot more of that. You know, I don't know how much he helps his mom. I don't even know if his mom's alive. I don't know, you know anything about these situations. I don't know um, what he's done in all these years of his life. And, but I have a caricature, and it stays very stagnant. It doesn't change. I hear his name, I hear his voice, and poof, he's like this. But those qualities are not actually intrinsically him, and they're probably not the same that were five years ago. And they're probably not the same ten years ago, right? As a matter of fact, I guess he used to be a Democrat, right? Now he's a Republican, whatever. So... As we enter into Buddhism, as we enter into this path, and this is where I'm starting at, is we have to understand that our mind sees something, labels it, that's the way it is, and it doesn't question. And so there's no room, there's no room for reality to come, because we've already judged it, and that's the way it is. And every time I hear him, I have a feeling, immediately. <laughs> he tends to be one of those guys, you're not very mediocre over him, you either like him or you don't like him. Right? And it's there. And the same thing with, with people in our life. You know, that person that uh, that did something mean to us 10 years ago, and we think, man, they're really a mean person. Right? 10 years ago, they did something really mean to me. They're a mean person. Every time I talk to them, people, I say, they're a mean person. Like, who knows what they've done in the last 10 years? It's quite possible. They may have done some nice things. It's possible. It might even be possible they did a lot of nice things before they did the one mean thing to me. But the only thing I see is that, and I make them so, and my job and the interaction. So, so the Buddha said, well, let's start paying attention. Where is all this suffering actually coming from? <laughs> is it those other people? Is it the situation? Is it the circumstances? Is that where it's really coming from? And what you find when you start looking is it's not the outer circumstances, not the events in our life. The mental afflictions are in my mind stream that arise in dependence upon and in relation to the events and the things that are happening and how I, the center of the universe, think it ought to be. <laughs> and so if somebody actually has an opinion differing than mine, they're clearly an idiot. And I get agitated that I have to even talk to the idiot. As if their opinion is any less valuable than mine or any less true. But the key point here, it's me. I become the center of the universe, and I see the world through my lens, and I think it's like this. And the common determinant factor in suffering or not is really I think things should be different than they are. Good luck with that. I think things should be different than they are. So we invite you to take a little time, and when you have fear, insecurity, anger, resentment, jealousy, envy, etc., where is it really coming from? Where is it really coming from? The outer circumstances are catalysts 
but they're not the cause. The, the cause of something needs to be the same thing, same stuff. So the cause of a mental state is, is in our mind. And it's how we relate to what's happening. It's not what's happening. So Booth starts saying, well, let's start paying attention to how your mind relates and label things. Now, does it label it accurately or not accurately? Are these qualities intrinsically in this person, this event, this thing? Are they there? Right? And if so, where are they? And, um, and what you tend to find out, I'll save you a little bit of looking, but you still need to look. Uh, spoiler alert. You'll find out <laughs> that they're not in those things intrinsically. It's an interdependent thing between you and an interaction and your values and how you see the world and how you're trained and your mental afflictions, your karma and your glacier and how you experience the world. So, um, so the invitation then is, wow, that's really empowering. If I'm the source of my mental suffering, I am also the source of my inner peace and well-being. And it's not dependent on you. <laughs> Either of them. Wow, that's a thought. That's an incredible thought. So 31 years ago, I had that little revelation. Which is probably why I'm here now, 31 years ago. And 31 years ago, in the midst of the greatest mental and emotional suffering I've had in my life, deepest pain I could imagine, uh, and that's funny, that's when we get these revelations. We don't get it when it's all good. <laughs> As a matter of fact, if it's all good, you probably wouldn't be here. Right? We come here because we've suffered some, right? We come here because we think there could be something more. But in that midst, I, uh, I had that very direct moment of realization that my suffering did not come from you, the circumstances, how I was raised came from how I was living my life. And the converse thing was, how do you counteract that? And and I didn't know any of this Buddhism back then. But consciously, what I chose to do uh, in seeking help and guidance from others that they advised me to do is rather than ask what can make me feel good, the question was, how can I help you? How can I help you? How can I participate in this life in a way that's beneficial to others? Now, I'm bringing this full cycle because where we're at in our teaching right now is, are you ready to cultivate bodhicitta? Are you ready to cultivate a mind that works for the benefit of all beings? Now, I had no idea that I had that even aspiration back then. I just didn't want to suffer. <laughs> It was bad. And I had no knowledge how to live. Uh, but what made sense to me is if I did things that were beneficial, I would start finding some peace and start feeling this hole in myself. And uh, so I tried it. Because, well, basically, I tried everything else. And, uh, and something changed over these, these years. By... Uh, by this, I, these seeds are being planted of the idea that I can make my life beneficial to others. I can live a meaningful life. The side effect is I find more inner peace. I find less struggle. I find less suffering. You can't bring joy and peace to others without bringing it to yourself. And no matter how many candles you light, your flame doesn't dim. And quite conversely, by getting out of becoming the center of the universe and being a part of the universe, automatically your suffering diminishes. Because your suffering's coming from one place. I'm the most important guy in the room. And think about that. Is that true? It's something to investigate. Where else could your suffering come from? We're running the universe. I think things should be different than they are. I actually think things should be different than they are. I mean, if you analyze that statement, you see how delusional it is. Because things are the way they are. And there's a cause for why they're the way they are. <laughs> right? They didn't happen out of nowhere. 
everything that happens, you can you don't have to have faith or say it's you know someone's will or any of that. You can just trace there's a cause. If there's a car accident, there was a cause for the car accident. There were two people on the road, there were roads, there were cars, things were built, there were all the causes that made that possible. So it happened. That's why there's it happened. Everything that happens, there's a cause. My mind thinks it shouldn't have happened. Or worse yet, I shouldn't have done something. Like, like I could have done something different, which is an interesting view. Could you have really done something different? Did you consciously at some point in your life say, I'm really going to mess this one up? <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> or at that moment, in that time, based on your life, your karma, your insecurity, your emotional state, you just did the best you could in that moment without a conscious decision to screw something up. Chances are you did the best you could with what you had at the moment. But somehow my mind says, well, I should have done, I could have done something different. And then my mind makes up a whole other story around that that says, and if I'd have done something different, it would have been way better. Neither of which ever happened, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't do anything different, so I have no idea what would have happened. But my mind will make up a story about how wonderful it would have been. So we have this mind, it spins tails, and, uh, and it uh, projects, projects qualities and characteristics on the environment out there, and we don't tend to question them. We just think that's the way it is. And if that were different, if you guys would just buck up and do what I would like, I would be happy finally. Please, straighten up, would you? My life is miserable. It doesn't work very well. I mean, it's a tough job arranging everybody's life. I mean, we're willing to do it, though, aren't we? Uh, so I said, well, let's look where the source is, and maybe we start working with the source, <laughs> which is my own mind. And if I notice that all these uh, events and people and activities in my life, well, they're an interrelational thing, and they're dependent upon me being involved in it. And if I've slept well, I'll have a totally different experience than if I haven't slept well. If I'm a little tired and irritable, my best friend's annoying as heck. If I'm well rested and had some you know, good exercise and feel great, an annoying person doesn't bother me at all. Any of the factors in my, my experience, it changes the experience. Right? You don't need to be a Buddhist for this. This is just the way things are. But we keep thinking, well, that's the cause of my suffering, not the fact I had not enough sleep. <laughs> or my mental state, or these things. We really look at out there. Which, you know, the analogy that uh, gets used a lot is, you know, if we're, if we're planting something in a garden, and uh, let's say, uh, let's go with onions. I like onions. We're planting onions, and onions don't grow very well. We don't usually say, man, those onions suck. Why didn't they grow well? We normally look at, well, what are the conditions, right? Was the soil right? Did they get enough water? Did they do that? You know, and we start looking at the, the bigger picture and why they didn't grow well. We don't say that the onion itself is a bad, you know, bad seed. Likewise, everything we experience has a lot of interactions and a lot of moving parts and this is a subjective and relational experience. But what we will find is something very true is that if I work on my mind, it changes everything else. And the funny thing is that's the only thing you got power over. I don't really have much power over you guys. I do have power over what I do. And so the message here becomes you need to liberate yourself. And it's actually quite empowering because you actually have control over the only thing that matters and it's not whether the price of gas goes up or not. It's how my, I can work with my mind to train my mind to see things more accurately. And that's ultimately all this is about. 
is learning to see things more accurately. And when you see things more accurately and you understand that there's a reason for things and the nature of life and how it is, we're really well equipped to respond to it in a way that can cultivate both merit and wisdom in our lives and, and have a meaningful life. Every experience in your life gives you an opportunity to make it more meaningful, whether it was pleasant or unpleasant. But we typically don't even have this conversation. <laughs> right? <coughs> we have the conversation on Wednesday Night Dharma Talk, maybe. And then we go out and say, well, so what's happening Saturday, man? Let's go hiking. Because <clears throat> hiking will make me feel good. And yet, hiking could be Dharma. Eating your meal could be Dharma. Going to the doctor could be Dharma. It can all be Dharma. And Dharma, in this definition, is Dharma is anything that eliminates suffering and cultivates genuine well-being on this path to enlightenment. And it can be done in all the things that we do if we bring our mind to it consciously. And now if we take that mind and and bring it with the aspiration of bodhicitta, then everything is magnified. Everything we do has incredible opportunity. And it is the force that directly applies an antidote to the root source of my suffering, which is my self-cherishing attitude, which thinks I'm more important than you. My kids are more important than you. My grandkids are much more adorable than yours. They're more valuable. And so why should my grandkids be... Why should I love them any more than I love you? Why? Are you any less valuable than my grandkids? I bet you're somebody's grandkids. And I bet that you're somebody's brother, sister, mother. Just like mine. But somehow because they're mine... <coughs> see, me and mine, I got a problem. Immediately, I'm separate, I'm different, and I'm looking out for me and mine. You will not find inner peace in looking out for the needs of me and mine. You automatically have stress. Competition and things to look out for. But you will find it in we and ours. As a matter of fact, that's where the force of that inner peace becomes as we and ours, that we're all in this together. And when you have good things happen, I can rejoice. I'm really happy because the world's a better place. You're doing better. And when you're doing better, you're not ripping off my car. So that's a good thing, too. When you're doing better, I don't need to lock my house at night, right? Um, and when you're suffering, what do you give the world? Suffering. When I'm suffering, what do I give the world? And so with this idea of bodhicitta, the idea of bodhicitta, and, and then, you know, for me, I brought it back to 31 years ago, I started doing something to look for how could I make my life meaningful. And at that time, it was out of guilt and shame, and I'd hurt every single person. I, I, I mean, I'm probably exaggerating. I've hurt most people in my life many times. And, and, I, and I just needed to atone for that. I needed to find a way to have some value. And so I started helping others and being a benefit to them. And in my case, uh, this was all done pre-Buddhism, but I was found out later in planting the seeds of bodhicitta of the opportunity to rid myself of me being the most important thing in the room and finding that I actually have much more inner peace when I realize I'm a part of your life. And that uh, when I'm able to think selflessly, I'm not selfish and self-centered and self-conscious. There's no self there to, to get like that. If you're stressed, worried, fearful, angry, resentful, or jealous, it's all about you. And when you look a little deeper, guess what? You can't be any of those things. I am jealous. 
Jealousy will come and go. You'll still be here. Are you jealous? I am really angry. Really, anger will come and go. Are you, is that you? Did that left? So again, we come back to reality. Reality is these are mental states of afflictions that are coming and going that I'm experiencing. But I identify to them, I make them mine, and I get caught up in them, and then they dictate my behavior. And literally, I'm powerless. Karma is just dragging my life around like a feather blown in the wind again and again and again. Always about me. So now, as we've gone through these, we've had 24 previous sessions, we looked at, um, we've looked at this and we said, well, how can I start changing my mind? And how can I work with it? And one of the primary ways was um, really ethics. <coughs> ethics became the foundation from which I can change my life. If I do things that stop creating negative mental afflictions in my mind, planting the seeds of anger, resentment, jealousy, etc., if I stop planting and watering those seeds, well, they're not going to be very strong. And if I do things ethically, things that I feel good about, if I stop stealing, if I stop hurting people, if I stop slandering people, I stop doing that, um, I actually create space in my mind because there's no tension there. There's no tension. There's no shame. There's no guilt. I get to, when I go to then move to concentration, I can actually start to concentrate because I'm not caught up in guilt and shame and stress and worry and competition and so forth. And so we've cultivated ethics. We've started living a life that we feel good about and we find inner peace. And then we apply that to concentration, to training the mind, to be able to attend to what we choose to instead of just grabbing on to every thought and impulse that it says. Hey, you should really worry about this. And your life would be a whole lot better if you had that apple pie. I just know it. Mm. And uh, and we don't question that. We just think, yeah, bring on the apple pie. Right? So our mind, we can start as it presents these wonderful bits of reality. We can start looking at it and saying, well, you know what? This isn't very healthy for me. I've done that a few times. It feels good temporarily, but boy, the long-term result, <laughs> not so good. <laughs> and this, this is something I would like to do more. I feel good when I do that, and it's helpful and it's beneficial. Uh, but we can't do it when our mind is unruly, busy, and constantly dragging us around. It doesn't create space for that. So ethics, concentration, a trained mind, that's why we meditate at the start of at our course here. Because we're starting to train the mind to go where we would choose to have it go. It, it gives us a gap between an impulse and a decision. And then we can really imbue that mind with wisdom to start seeing things a little more accurately. How is it? Is this really true? Is that person really a jerk? I know, I've told the jerk story a million times. By the way, spoiler alert, there are no jerks. It's just human beings. So our mind presents that, and we get to challenge it. We get to challenge it and say, is it true? So all of Buddhism is, what is true? What's true? There's no need for, you know, uh, some idea and some view and some vision of believing in things that we don't need to. It's asking the question, is this true? And if it's true, and if we live in reality, the hypothesis is pretty straightforward. And I like to think of it, uh, Robina Corton that we have videos with a lot. Chasing, uh, what was that called? Well, was, we, we've done many with her. Um, Ch but chasing something. Chasing the Buddha, baby. She made a video. Yeah, yeah, we've watched a few. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, uh, the thing she likes to say is, take it as a working hypothesis. Working hypothesis. Can you be upset, angry, frustrated, resentful, whatever, and that be based in reality? It's an interesting thing. Note that. But next time you're really angry, is that based in reality? See if it's true. It's interesting. 
So the working hypothesis is that if you lived in reality, those things can arise. Cannot arise. Your natural state of mind is blissful, luminous, non-conceptual. You will find a peaceful love there. You will not find an anger and resentment and jealousy there. Won't be. So as we enter in Buddhism, we just want to start seeing, is any of this true? Does it make sense? Can I try it out? Does it work? And so there's no blind faith here. It's, hey, this seems to make sense or this doesn't make sense. And if it does make sense, well, I'm going to give it a go, and I'm going to see if this works. And if it does, then you find some benefit. So my stages went on for a while, and my life got better, and eventually you know, I found Buddhism, and it just, I found that I'd actually been practicing it before I learned it. <laughs> And, uh, and then these last 15 years have been, uh, you know, another piece of that. But with it, and where we're at now, is entering into the Mahayana view, which says, um, you know, now that I, I believe that I can be free of suffering, I believe that I can be free and liberated from not having these states of mind. Well, I notice that I have all this suffering. I look at all of you and I think, well, you know what? They're all suffering too. Is my suffering any more important than yours? Are you any less important than my grandkids? And it says that, you know, everything I have in my life is because of you. Which is true. One more time. Everything I have is because of others. There's nothing I have on my own. I couldn't eat. I wouldn't know how to speak. I couldn't have gone to school, couldn't be wearing these clothes. I mean, every single thing I have in my life is because of everybody else. And animals are included in this, right? When you eat a meal, <laughs> how many beings are involved in that meal? Over what period of time? It's quite phenomenal when you look at it. And if I'm so important in you, I don't see those things. But when I start to realize we're all in this together, and we may have been in this together for numerous lifetimes, then I think, wow. I start cultivating the idea that I want all of you to be liberated. And that's where we look at bodhicitta. Bodhicitta is two things. Two things. One is, I want to be liberated. I am going to dedicate my life to being fully liberated from all of these mental sufferings and a constant realm of rebirth and karmic afflictions. And I want everyone else to be liberated and I'm going to work for their benefit. It's not I want everyone to be better off but I don't really want to work for liberation. <laughs> and it's not I want to work for liberation and you know if I have to help others you know that's okay. It's really both. It's really both together. And uh, and so imagine the state of mind, which sounds quite quite large, right? Quite a task. That I'm going to dedicate this life, this rare and precious human rebirth that I have, that very few human beings have, the opportunity, the resources, the 18 specific qualities that I have in this lifetime right now, and you have it by virtue of being here in this moment many lifetimes have happened so you could be with all the right conditions be fully enlightened and that you're going to dedicate your life and make the most meaningful of your days to be fully liberated for the benefit of all beings sounds like a little more than a hike on a Tuesday right well it sounds like this big aspiration so I think well is that possible and then the next question is why not you know, why not? If I, are there others who have done this? And we would say, yeah, there are others who have done this. And could I talk to others who have done this? I personally would say, yes, you could talk to others who are, who are doing this. Uh, but, but because of that, that does not really cultivate enough oomph. Because we really need to start with what's practical and clear for you and where you're at. So we got to take these little baby steps. we got to test it out. Number one, hey, can I be angry and that be based in reality? And are there people that seem to have overcome some of this? And 
if I start working with, uh, if I become a little more ethical, does my life get better? Do I find more peace? If I start uh, not getting caught up in my mind, uh, can I start directing it to this moment? And does my life get better? Does my suffering diminish? Can I do things in my everyday life that cultivate inner peace and tranquility? And if you start doing that, you start getting a sense of faith that's based on actual evidence. Not, I read it in a book. Not, this great mama told me so. Not, um, you know, this charismatic whoever said so. Or told me I had these great qualities. Because you yourself are experiencing it. And so that's where we start. So where we're talking about now is a place to get to. And it's a place to get to based on faith, based on your own process, based on uh, your own evidence and experience. Not because it's in a book and not because, you know, someone you know, you know, seems to have a lot of inner peace. You need to try it out. So a couple questions as we get ready for bodhicitta and cultivating that. We, uh, we've already gone through the two ways to cultivate it. We've already gone through the benefits of cultivating it. Uh, so we had seven point cause and effect and we had equalizing, exchanging self for others. These are the two methods. And now in these teachings, what we want to remember is that we're teaching the whole path. And even though we might be here, I'm just trying to be nice to my neighbor and try to think about some good qualities in them, but they're probably not really a jerk, even though they really seem like one right at the moment. That might be where we're at, and that's incredible, because that's cracking the door to reality. Um, to do the Lam Rim, we teach you the whole path, so you kind of get a nice overview of where you're going and how it works. So even though I'm here, I'm starting to get a view of, imagine the idea of cultivating bodhicitta and being able to imbue that in everything that I do. So bodhicitta, to have the mind that when you wake up in the morning, the first thing you think about is how you can use this day that will never come again to eliminate suffering in your own life and benefit all beings. Imagine that mind. I'll tell you what, it gets you out of bed. It gets you out of bed with zest. It allows you to put your feet on the board, you know, on the floor in a way that gives your life meaning and purpose. So some of the advantages of this, we've covered it before, but I, I want to read a couple of these, these really nice ones. Is If we can cultivate that mind, if we can bring even a semblance of that mind into our activities, um, you're going to be able to purify negative karma a lot quicker. You're going to find purpose in your life and every day. It will be the antidote to sadness and despair. It will be, let me see what they got here. It helps you overcome interferences in your daily life, obstacles that arise. I mean, be, those obstacles actually become an opportunity to be a benefit to the life that you have in others. Um, your, all the merit that we collect to have our realizations ripen happen a lot quicker. Just think of it this way, that all the, the good deeds that we do in our life, it's a field of merit, a field of positive potential we create. And it's nice if I do something nice for someone. But if my mind's going, I'm doing this to really free and liberate all beings and eliminate suffering and achieve enlightenment, and that same activity, it's like pouring fertilizer over this field of merit. And so all of our positive potentials really ripen much quicker. And, uh, and the quicker we can call to mind the unwholesome activities and purify those, it's much more forceful. Uh, so it really, it's like jet fuel to the path of enlightenment if we cultivate it. But that's not why we cultivate it. If you cultivate it for that, it doesn't work so well. <laughs> it really has to come from a heartfelt connection with others and a deep understanding of the interrelationship that we all have and have had for a long time. And just when, you know, if you saw your mom suffering, wouldn't you do just about anything to help her? If you saw your child suffering, wouldn't you do just about anything to help them? And so it's really bringing that vision to all beings that you come across. They're just like your kids. Of course you're going to help them. And you'll do what it takes. And a fascinating byproduct of this is you suffer less automatically. You suffer less automatically. 
My suffering is about a self-cherishing attitude. What I want, how things are for me, what's going on in my life, what I don't have, how it could be better, what others have that I don't have. Instead of the ability to be a part of everybody else and the life that we have. So it, it's a really incredible opportunity. So as we um, get to this mind that calls upon the value, the potential, the opportunity to be free of all suffering, to become enlightened, to see things as they actually are, without all my karma and clashes and fantasies and stories, and to just rest with things as they are, to be totally liberated from that. And then I can help all beings. It's a beautiful state of mind to get to. And if you get to that point, then you look at these two types of bodhicitta. Asp aspiration, so aspirational, aspiring bodhicitta, and engaged bodhicitta. And that's where we are in our Lam Rim right now. Is we come to a point where we say, this is, I'm ready. So aspiring bodhicitta says, I really want this. I see the value in this. And it's worth it. Engage bodhicitta is the next level of that that says, not only do I really want it and know about it and deeply care about it, I'm doing it. I'm diving in. I'm engaged and I'm on it. Uh, Tubden Children has the analogy that aspiring bodhicitta is like, you know, your life, you really want to go to, I don't know, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to pick Thailand, right? Thailand. You really want to go to Thailand. You aspire to go to Thailand. You really want to go there. It's meaningful. It's something you've always wanted to do, and you're making a commitment to, to go there in your lifetime. But you really don't know how much it costs to go to Thailand. <laughs> you don't know the travel things. You don't know much about the hotels. But, but, but that doesn't mean you don't really want to go there and that you have a commitment to go there, right? I mean, I've, I used to want to go to Thailand a lot, and I had never looked up the prices. Engage bodhicitta is you've bought the tickets, <laughs> you're getting on the plane, you know, and you're going. So, uh, so you come to this point where we want to say, and if it's aspiring, if I'm making that, there's two types of, we have lots of lists in Buddhism. So of the two types of bodhicitta and aspiring bodhicitta, there's, there's two types. One is um, you, can, you can really make and cultivate that mind on your own without uh, direct formal vows or commitments uh, and then there's a, a special type where you make certain uh, commitments, these sort of eight precepts that you can really engage in that, that really and, and when we talk about precepts or vows they're commitments but they're commitments in a sense of this is really going to help you achieve that, they're not you can't do this because they're really designed as a way to really help you sustain and cultivate your bodhicitta. So in an aspiring bodhicitta with these eight, uh, they're, te they're sort of precepts. They're not the same as vows, really, these eight. Uh, but they're, uh, they're these, these sort of suggested commitments that you make that help you sustain the bodhicitta mind that you've created, both in this lifetime and in future lifetimes. And, um, and then... As you get ready, you enter in and say, "Well, I'm 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 all in. I'm taking bodhisattva vows. I am joining the family of Buddhas. I'm becoming a bodhisattva." And you become ready to take bodhisattva vows. And uh, and there's 18 of those uh, root and 46 uh, additional vows or auxiliary. Um, and and those vows really support a mind that can really flourish with the idea of benefiting all beings as you achieve enlightenment. Uh, so I don't think we're going to cover all those vows here. Uh, but, uh, and I think that I may make a day where we do, because some of you took them, accidentally maybe. Uh, those of you that were doing the uh, Chen Rei Sig empowerment, <laughs> they said, now we're going to do the Bodhisattva vows, repeat in Tibetan. Uh, so and some people have asked about what they committed to. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so I, I may make a half day for those people who are interested, and we'll go through those. Um, 
But the point of our teachings now is to say that um, where we are on the path is we're entering this realm of the highest practitioner, the great scope of where um, you cultivate a mind that is really imbued with the benefit of all beings in all of your activities as you purify your own and become free of all suffering. It's a really great mind of accumulating. And then you engage in these uh, practices, these six far-reaching attitudes, often called the six perfections, six far-reaching attitudes. And, um, and this becomes the path of the Bodhisattva. And these six are, are quite wonderful, and they're far-reaching. They're far-reaching because they encompass all beings. They're far-reaching because of your own mind and attitudes it can bring. And, um, and so they are, and I'll just quickly list them, um, so we've got uh, generosity, so the mind of generosity. And, uh, and this generosity is not limited to, you know, giving people things. It's not limited to that. It's really generous with your time, with your energy, with helping people, with easing people, with freeing them from fear. Uh, there's generosity of helping with material needs. There's a generosity of providing dharma. And again, dharma is providing people, I mean, Dharma is anything that's eliminating suffering and leading towards genuine happiness. I mean, that's what we're talking about. Um, ethics, you know, and an ethics of, of a sense of for the benefit of all beings, really avoiding negative mental states that inhibit your ability uh, to help others and cultivating virtuous ones. When we go to um, generosity, ethics, concentrate, not concentration, generosity, ethics, patience. Patience, the ability to rest in uncomfortable places when things are challenging and difficult. Uh, this to me seems to be such a powerful opportunity because it's something that's very challenging to do. All of our worry, stresses, problems, and fears, guess what? They pass. How often do we let them pass without, I mean, so many times in your life, not doing nothing is doing something, <laughs> or not doing something, yeah. Patience is an action. It's, an, it's a choice to not engage and make things worse. <laughs> it's a choice to not have to meddle. It is some of the most powerful things you can do is allow a feeling to come and go. <laughs> Patience. Joyous effort. Joyous effort's the next one. Sometimes called uh, perseverance. I like to think it's, and it seems to start off as perseverance and later becomes joyous effort. Um, but, uh, but the idea of really putting the, uh, the effort into, uh, into your ethics, to your values, to benefiting others, to you know, choosing to make your practice uh, valuable and meaningful in all things that we do. And that takes an effort. And then concentration and then wisdom. So these become the ground, the, the path of the Bodhisattva. Um, there's a couple ways of, of looking at. One is that the first five are method and the sixth one is wisdom. Method and wisdom, the two birds of a feather of enlightenment. Another way is the first three are really cultivating the highest potentials for others. So when we think about that uh, generosity, ethics, and patience, others. And then the other three are for your own self, right? Your own effort, <coughs> concentration, and wisdom. But they're always interrelated. And so this journey then, and where we'll start uh, next week, is really unpacking this path of a bodhisattva, these six far-reaching attitudes. When I do my refuge prayer in the morning, uh, it often says, you know, generosity and the other far-reaching attitudes. But I like to say generosity and then take a moment and think, have I been generous? How can I be more generous? Uh, ethics, and I call the mind, you know, ethics. I'd say all six, ethics. And, you know, I'm really going to be ethical today. I'm going to watch my mind. I'm going to watch what I say. Uh, patience, you know, wow. 
I'll tell you what, it's such a powerful tool, patience. Just breathe. A breath or two sometimes can make all the difference. All that anger and resentment isn't here five minutes later. <laughs> but boy, if I watered it, it would be here real quick. It's like come and go. Um, effort. What kind of effort am I going to put into my life today? What am I going to do to really cultivate the moments of my life. Concentration, making sure I meditate, make sure I bring conscious awareness into my daily activities because concentration is not limited to a cushion. It's paying attention to what's happening in our life and seeing what's true, which cultivates wisdom and wise interaction. Wisdom to understand that everything I'm experiencing in life is a subjective relational experience. And everything that I experience in life is an opportunity for me to make the most meaningful existence of this day that will never come again. This day that will never come again. Isn't that a nice way to start your day? The thing is, we need to bring this to our mind all the time. Because our mind does not naturally go there. <laughs> right? We could wake up shaping our attitude immediately from here's a day that will never come again. How can I live this rare and precious human rebirth that I have to eliminate suffering in myself and others? Or we can wake out of bed, where's the damn coffee? <laughs> right? I actually set my coffee pot up at night so it's made, you know. So I don't have to worry about it. It's already there. And then I can think about this and then stagger to the coffee pot. But you can start shaping your mind right away, but we need to bring this to our conscious thing because our mind will take over. So the problem is our mind. <laughs> and once you really get that, life is so simple. It is so simple. But it's not an easy reali realization to get. You and I can talk about it all day long, and it can make sense, and that doesn't help you at all. <laughs> I do all workshops, so I'll go in and tell the whole insurance company, show them how delusional they are. And how they keep <laughs> stabbing themselves in the head with a fork and, and they'll, they'll get it and I'll tell you, but you know what? This won't help you at all. <laughs> Knowing it doesn't help you. Knowing it doesn't help you. What does help you is acting on the knowledge. Having the prescription is one thing. Getting it filled is another. Actually taking the medicine <laughs> has a lot bigger impact. And so that's where we just really encourage you every day to, you know, from each teaching, take some time that week and think about what's being said. In Lam Rim, the idea is to meditate a little bit on what was said today. And so, you know, one of the things I'd encourage you on is, is where does your suffering come from? Where does your anger, resentment, jealousy come from? Does it come from that other person? Is that person intrinsic? Does it come from that situation? How many situations in our life were terrible and years later it was the best thing that ever happened to me? It changed my life. You know, I got fired from a job. It was horrible. Well, I have this new job. It's wonderful. Because I lost this job. And start paying attention to where does your suffering, fears, and security come from. And so that would be my encouragement. Even though right now we're starting to think about then the other piece of what are the benefits of bodhicitta and how can I really bring this to, to benefiting others. Yeah. So next week we'll come back with, uh, with the six far-reaching attitudes and the path of a bodhisattva. Okay, and, and if there are people who would like to unpack the uh, bodhisattva vows, you know, I think uh, just let me know, and we'll do that by request and set a day and go through them. Because I know some people, some people took the empowerment and they came up. So those vows we took, mm -hmm. you know, what are we doing? So it's good to know what vows you take. It's good to not enter into things lightly, and they're good vows. They're very helpful. Very helpful. All right. So I thank all of you, and uh, we will do our dedication, dedicating the merit and wisdom we have accumulated here today for the benefit of all beings.
Let us dedicate the virtue and wisdom we have accumulated both individually and collectively, both today and throughout our lives. We dedicate this for the benefit of all beings. May all beings be free of suffering and find lasting happiness. And may we be able to use the virtue and wisdom we've accumulated here today and throughout our lives to purify our own minds to achieve enlightenment for the benefit of all beings. Thank you all so much, and uh, Saturday at 8.30, we'll be doing a Buddha of Compassion practice, and all are welcome for that.